On behalf of Berliner Künstlerprogramm des DRD, I warmly welcome you at the DRD Gallery. I warmly welcome Daniela Leikam as well, our cooperation partner from KfW Stiftung. I'm very happy to, to say, to welcome also Kwesi, Kwesi Ohene Haye and Tracy Nakoshi Thompson who are going to give a presentation tonight as a result of Kwesi Ohene Haye's residency as a curator in Berlin. Uh, before I introduce you to the protagonists of this evening, I would like to invite Daniela uh, to sh briefly present what we have been doing together in the last five years and oh. what <laughs> KfW Stiftung. Yeah, well, this is a big aim. <laughs> Hello and welcome. I just really want to say uh, a few very brief words about the framework of tonight's event. Um, yeah, uh, the format has been chosen by Kwesi himself. It's part of his residency. It's a curator residency for young emerging curators from the regions, very broad regions, outer European regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Middle East, to come to Frankfurt, spend six months here, um, really in, go in depth about their research, uh, develop their professional network. And uh, Kwesi uh, is our current fellow. Kwesi, we're very happy to have you. Um, thank you for being here. And thank you both for being here tonight and uh, sharing your, your input with us. Um, yeah, it's a cooperation between the DID Berlin uh, uh, Artists in Berlin program, as uh, Silvia Fehrmann already mentioned, and the Foundation KfW Stiftung in Frankfurt. Um, I think I'm going to leave it this short. I will be around later to answer more questions if they come up. But uh, thank you very much, Silvia Fehrmann, um, the DID Berlin Artists program. Uh, it's been a really, really good partner for us. Um, thank you to Melanie, Melanie Romillier, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, uh, and everyone involved in setting up this evening. Um, it's always, uh, always good to have joint parties for, for, uh, yeah, for such an event. Um, thank you to uh, also Sonja Alt from Café Stiftung, who um, uh, helped building this up tonight, and of course, uh, thank you, you too. <laughs> um, I think this is all from my side, and uh, we're very happy to now uh, welcome our two protagonists of the evening. Thank you. I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the two of you. Uh, Kwesi Ohene is an artist, curator, and writer based in Kumasi, Ghana. He's the current grant holder of KfW Stiftung's program Curators in Residence. Um, Ohene Eye has curated Silence Between the Lines, Anagrams of Emancipated Futures and in 2015 and Orderly, Disorderly uh, in 2017, both organized by Black Star Lines Kumasi, the contemporary art incubator based um, at Kwame Nukram University of Science and Technology. He was guest curator for the inaugural Lagos Biennial in 2017 and recently curated Spectacles Specu Speculations in 2018, featuring 16 artists from Ghana, Holland, and Colombia in Kumasi. He's cur currently a PhD student at KNUST and uh, publishes essays on his blog. You will find uh, the blog address on uh, this publication. Artist Tracy Na Koshie Thompson explores the from Ghana explores the latent ability of ubiquitous materials, synthetic or natural, to transform into unrecognizable, strange, new and mimicry forms. For this purpose, Thompson employs alchemical processes of dissolution and crystallization of the varied morphology of things. Her emancipated approach to art making creates a disposition that transcends given notions of the art apparatus itself and questions what it could poten potentially be. She has participated in two large scale exhibitions organized by Black Star Lines Kumasi in Accra, namely Cornfields in Accra 2016 and Orderly Disorderly 2017. Uh, Thompson is an, is an MFA student at KNUST and is currently participating in the Intercontinental Exchange Program at the Städel Schule in Frankfurt. And I think I have not read, outread the anagram KNUST, which is Kwame Nukram University of Science and Technology. If I was too fast, I have done it now. So please take the stage, let's take a seat. Yes. After this, a QA. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, 
coming. This is weather conditions that I find very extreme, so I'm glad that you were able to broach it and, uh, and join us. Uh, thank you to the KFW uh, Stiftung and the DAD for making this happen for me. Um, Daniela, Sylvia, Melanie, um, Jan, and everybody uh, from these institutions. Thank you also to Tracy, who um, uh, I'm grateful that you accepted my invitation to join me so we could um, expand the theme, give examples. What we will do today is uh, the argument you see up on the screen is, is a curatorial direction of mine. And the residency, I used it within this time to think through um, my work and also um, to chart um, a future direction. So I wanted to open that up to you. And um, it is as open as it sounds. Uh, it is an argument. So. Um, feel free to engage when it is um, after our submissions. I am an artist who uses curating and uh, writing as mediums through which to think about the world, um, legislate ideas and manipulate objects and, and so on. And so I find that um, I bring, the attitude I bring to curating is an extremely uh, open-minded one and very plastic one as well. So what, what, what I would do is, in talking about my curatorial direction, I chose this theme so that, uh, to give you a better context, I would ground it in the um, emancipatory framework uh, that was initiated by Black Star Lines Kumasi in Ghana. And this has been going on since 2003, and I really owe the foundational principles and um, um, assumptions within my own practice. I cannot talk about uh, what I do without um, taking you back to uh, Black Star Lines and that community in Ghana. And so that is the, the example I will use. And because I've also curated at least two, um, say three exhibitions with that group, I'm using those exhibitions as examples that illustrate the, uh, the points that I will be making. So with this as the, as the background, I hope we are all good to go. Also, if you find uh, the brochure on your seat, please don't ignore it. It is, um, in order not to overburden the presentation with too much information, I took time to uh, deal explicitly, ex explicitly with some of the technical um, aspects of my talk. So the essay is really, um, it's an extension of the talk. So if you are interested in more information, I will just hit on some points here, but I elaborate more in the text so you can take time when you uh, have some time. What do I mean by curating in the void? This is something that has been nagging uh, at me for some time now. So I thought to uh, use my time in Berlin to unpack it. Berlin has been good to me, if I, if I uh, to be totally honest, except for the weather. Um, before I go to curating, I want to talk about art because I think uh, curating takes its cue from art. So I will begin by w what I mean by uh, art and then build it from there. Because those, um, the, the premise will, I think, um, necessarily affect what I do as a curator. So in Kumasi, um, with the community, known as Black Star Lines, we think of art as, we say that if anything can be said to be art today, it must necessarily be invented. So we do not make uh, presumptions about what art is or what we have inherited about it. We think that in our time, it is imperative that we um, rethink the very uh, being or the very thing of art itself. And that is where 
through emancipation lies. Um, so in Karikata Seydou's formulation, is he says, art is anything that is radically new. And I agree. Uh, my argument can be summed up in a line, the universality of art. And what I mean by this is that um, once we posit art in that universal space or in that universal dimension, what we are really talking about is its secular nature. And when we put um, art in a secular space, we're saying that it ought not privilege any one particular um, mode, process, trend, or kind of content that it may inhere. Some of the processes and, and so on indeed are yet to be invented. Some technologies which are yet to be um, to be created will perhaps affect or create new forms, new techniques, new ways of experiencing art. And so um, that secularness we, we are um, radically committed to. So once we cite it in a secular space, that means that it always already begins with the many. Um, which we call the multiplicity. And so um, by talking about the universality of art, we are, talk, we are really implying that at any moment that we make that invocation, it comes with um, a plethora of processes, formats, styles, subject matter, trends, etc. If you don't mind, I will just sip some water. Yes, so um, if the multiplicity, or if this multiplicity, which is really the content, um, if uh, we are to be true to uh, the secular nature, and if these, multiplic these multiplicities are contingent, and if they may beget more multiplicities, well, we are talking about the space that is created is the void. And that void is not um, a hollow or an empty space. Well, we are, the void is really, um, thank you. By the void here, I mean um, the substance of multiplicity. And these could be funneled down into uh, an argument really for equality. So we are saying that no one process, no one trend, no one style um, is more important or less important than the other. In the context of art, for the sake uh, in when we remain um, in that region, we must restrict ourselves and we must respect um, the conditions of the void. But not every universal category um, hinges its conditions on equality. That's also, I must be clear. And so just because a thing is, um, may aspire to uh, the universal or may even have processes of um, universalization, it does not necessarily mean that it, uh, it binds itself to preserving uh, an, an equal relationship between things within itself. So I have to be clear on that. So my interest is in um, those processes of universalization that preserve the uh, equal status of things. And this is in the background. This idea becomes, um, let's say, subversive with the when I take you through the history of art education in Ghana. In the Gold Coast, which is what Ghana in the uh, pre-independence era used to be called, art education, or let's say education as we know it now, has its roots in the 19th century. Um, around that time, 
a lot of ideas were circulating in Europe, um, Northern Europe, Western Europe, about uh, a way forward, you know. It was about, um, education was thought to be a means through which to sort of affect uh, the future, to address social problems, you know, things like greed, corruption, you know. Um, if you wanted to, oh, the ills of society, so to speak, on the one hand. And because in that epoch, time was thought of as progressing in a linear direction, you know, past, present, and future. If you wanted to change the, um, if you thought things were going bad in your time, and if you wanted to change how people behaved, it was logical to target um, children. So child-centered educational schemes were very popular around that time, and, and we can trace it to, um, uh, from Switzerland to even Germany, um, with the kindergarten um, you know, system of education. And partly because of the uh, religious dimension, um, to teach morals to children, you know, to, uh, to, to equip them with skills. If you study pedagogues like uh, Frobel and um, Pesalossi before him, the idea was to, uh, because children were thought as essentially blank slates, you know, so you teach them through engaging them with physical objects, so their hands, uh, things they could move around, uh, you know, objects you could make for them. So the limbs were very important, and it was a verificationist um, theory or kind of uh, training. So a lot of crafts-based, um, child-centered educational programs were burgeoning around that time. And on the economic side, governments invested in these kinds of trainings for, because industrial capitalism was burgeoning also at the time, it, it was a bit profitable to uh, train children with, um, in vocationalist programs, uh, calligraphy and so on, and train them for the industry, right? So these were two angles that were animating uh, child-centered educational programs. So Ghana became a colony in 1874, an official colony of the British. So in the late 19th century, um, this, these vocationalist programs were the ones that were taught, uh, taught in the British Isles, and they were taught to working class children. These were the same programs that were exported to the colonies in um, Southeast Asia, in Africa. So these crafts-based programs, uh, which taught uh, drawing as a series of geometricized uh, you know, shapes and so on, uh, because Ghana, or let's say, the colonies did not have, um, they did not have an industrial system. They were not industrialized. Mainly the colonies were agrarian. In, um, in, in scope. So uh, migrating these crafts-based programs to former colonies really was not about developing industrial, um, the industrial sector. So what it became was that uh, these manual training programs became the foundation for modern art history in Ghana. And it's not just Ghana. This, uh, we could say the same for Uganda, Nigeria, and so on and so forth. So this crafts-based um, curriculum, which was decontextualized, uh, and then shipped off, you know, migrated and adapted to the colonies, um, became the foundational frameworks for what art as we have it now will be based on. And so, because they were child-centered in orientation, uh, teacher training was also the 
natural thing. So uh, it was not meant to train an artist, um, a fine artist to practice. If you train under these programs, drawing and um, calligraphy and all these other things, you were, it was a teacher training, or it came initially as a teacher training program. The German, um, Swiss, and Scottish missionaries who came to the, the Gold Coast, uh, also when they started their missionary schools, were training um, converts in this program. So we'll see that, uh, and the curriculum that came was hand and eye. Hand and eye, just by the name, we see that it was very retinal realist. If you were blind, um, it doesn't account for you. If you don't have eyes, if you don't have an arm, you know, how do you uh, find your way through a system like that? So that is a system that already privileges um, particular manifestations of art, you see. And that is what endured uh, since the 19th century. It underwent re um, slight reforms and modifications until 2003 when these assumptions were being radically revised. So according to Karikacha Seydou, who is the current um, dean of the Faculty of Art in the foremost art college in Ghana, KNUST. Uh, in the Gold Coast, art education was conducted on the literal, optical, and descriptive reading of the world, especially in the Victorian and pre-World War II epochs. The colonial subject was afforded a very narrow conception of visuality, which sidestepped important aspects of the complex incentives afforded by the practice of the discipline. Even at a time in the history of art when alternative forms of visuality and representation were beginning to elicit legitimation. Uh, this point references when the, the British um, art curriculum was very resistant to, uh, even from the mid 19th century when um, the early modernists in France were posing new questions in art, um, the British were highly resistant of these influences until the mid 20th century. So that is the inclination or the disposition that uh, Ghana also inherited. And for a long time we shared parallels in curriculum. Seydou goes on to say that in Kumasi, which is in KNUST, like other schools in West Africa, the default ethos was akin to 1930s social realism with rural or urban subject matter and setting. Art practice was grounded in Beaux-Arts um, conservatism. And the range of subjects that you would find in um, KNUST, for example, but I'm using that as an example to um, really talk about uh, Ghana as a whole and even West Africa in general. So uh, still life and landscape and life painting, modeling and so on were the default academy, um, official academy um, range of uh, formats. In painting, it was the pictorial format that was um, the standard. And every other form or medium that fell outside of these ranges was um, stigmatized. So that became the hegemony. Uh, Seydou continues to say that there was also a missed opportunity to inject the practical curriculum with lessons of eccentric, de-skilled, and conceptual practices already at play in African art, its cognates, and material cultures, media, and technology beyond established art. The late 1980s and 1990s saw the hegemony of touristy afro kitsch eclectic and superficial juggling with established social realist and early modernist pictorial styles and romanticized African subject matter. Um, in art history, for example, or when KNUST began 
um, its degree program. It was contemporaneous with uh, the UK and the shifts that had happened in education at the time. KNUST began its degree program in 64, 1964. And by then, um, the British had begun to reform their own curriculum. That was when, in 1960, um, you know, the Bauhaus, some of the Bauhaus ideas had begun to make inroads um, into their own art curriculum. That's when they really began to open up to influences from other parts of Europe. So even if we were to remain with the, the British or the colonial um, system, uh, that was itself, you know, it was not enough, you see, because they themselves were not um, functioning on the principle of uh, universality. It was quite narrow and conservative in that um, framework. So uh, Seydou, who is an artist, a poet, um, and a scholar, began his emancipatory art teaching project when he joined the Faculty of Art in 2003. And um, with this nagging question, he really began to uh, sort of deconstruct the foundational uh, theories and principles upon which um, art, art education, art practice, um, and so on were practiced in Ghana, or especially in the College of Art. So in his formulation, we could summarize the essence of his emancipatory art teaching as uh, a hope to transform art from the status of commodity to gift. Um, to dwell on this a little bit, a commodity symbolizes or signifies um, a framework or a system that tends to um, annex what might be common to all of us, and it wants to annex it to private property. What the gift in this opposition does is to preserve the conditions of uh, what is common to us all. So the, um, the gift here is a metaphor for the universality of art that privileges equality. Um, and the commodity, as we understand it, in a strict um, capital-oriented uh, system is that which lends itself to private property. A commodity, as we know, is regulated by uh, four chain processes. Um, production, uh, distribution, exchange, and consumption. These are the four elements that regulate it. If you take the last two, exchange and consumption, uh, there are two value systems that regulate it, exchange value and uh, use value, right? And this contradiction between use value and exchange value tends to privilege uh, exchange values, right? And exchange value are uh, symbolized in the money form, whether credit money or uh, paper money. So if you don't have money, that is an exclusionary tactic to, you know, to access a commodity. But a gift is not regulated by the same, um, you know, the same sort of dynamics. A gift does not privilege exchange values. It doesn't mean you can't sell your work. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you can't participate in the uh, art market if you want to. But the point is that the art market is not the defining factor. A work of art, even if we came to, uh, even if we were to be practical, I don't always want to sell everything I make, right? So um, what we don't want to do is to have uh, one element which would be the exchange value, which is a site of inequality, really. You know, that's where inequality is manufactured. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but if we move into a gift economy, then that means you know, things could be a bit more flexible. And um, no one could take precedence over another. 
to see how this works out in exhibitions that we have curated, I will show you this video. This is the opening of um, Orderly Disorderly, which we organized in 2017. What I want to draw your attention to in this clip is the diversity of audiences that are present. You'll find that um, there are uh, high school uh, students, there are children, there are um, people who belong to what is called the surplus population, those who are in the um, underclass whose labor tend to be exploited. These are the groups of women moving in your picture. They work with Ibrahim Mahama, who uh, deals with these um, issues of labor and capital and exploitation in his work. Uh, it goes, the demographics range, we do, we do not, we go out of our way to invite um, non-traditional exhibition visitors. So um, we go to marketplaces, we go to um, corporate institutions, we, we really try to engage because for us, um, art is something that we should all be able to at least access as far as experience and engagement. And uh, because of this, we, our exhibitions are free and they are not commercial. So uh, this was one of the large scale exhibitions between 2015 and 2017. We had a trilogy of large scale exhibitions in Accra. Uh, I will give you more about it. So Black Star Alliance is the contemporary art institution that is responsible for uh, instigating these ideas, uh, particularly in relation to our uh, art education, uh, which came mainly through the missionary and the colonial structures. But then, um, in, in a time when uh, technologies like the internet and other things have radicalized how we experience the world, we we think that it is imperative to um, break out of these and also consider the bigger picture all the time. So the exhibitions since 2015 that we have worked on and that I have worked on with Black Star Lines, uh, um, Silence Between the Lines, which happened in Kumasi, it was a much smaller show. It featured uh, 17 artists. There were three co-curators. Um, and then, in that same year, 2015, to the far left, we have The Gown Must Go to Town, which honored a speech made by uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, um, who was a, a very prominent Pan-Africanist. So, um, The Gown Must Go to Town was an imperative he laid on when he was commissioning the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana in um, Accra. And um, we used the exhibition to, um, to break that veil between what was going on in the academy and what was uh, in the town, like the metaphor for, for what exists outside of the academy. Uh, the following year, we had cornfields in Accra which featured, um, the Gamas Go to Town featured 57 um, uh, artists, students. What, what we do is we tend to, 
to mix up the participants because we are using these exhibitions first as ways of um, staging what has been hibernating in the in the Kumasi community for uh, the past 15 years at least, but we also want to use it as a way of documenting and telling the story of uh, Ghanaian art, but uh, art in, in Africa and even beyond. So the following year, the participants grew. Uh, in 2016, there were 82 artists uh, from the graduating class, guest artists, um, living, non-living artists, and so on. And Cornfields in Accra honored uh, a poem by Amate Du, one of uh, the great writers uh, from Ghana. We honored her with her life work with this exhibition. This exhibition also honored um, Godilai, the Cameroonian conceptual artist who at some point uh, came to Ghana and, and realized the project. So that work we have in the Black Star Lines archive. So we, uh, we staged it to honor his memory and his contribution to art in, um, in Africa. Then 2017 was the last in the trilogy of uh, large scale shows and that featured 109 artists and it had seven curators of which I was one. Um, some of the curatorial uh, strategies or models that we came up with to work on these exhibitions because of their scale and also because of the, um, the ideas that we were trying to put together, we had to go beyond uh, what we already knew and test ourselves. So, Collective curating is one uh, where a group of curators are working on a show. We believe that curating, uh, the curators must always be present. So, um, you know, we can't have an exhibition and then maybe travel or uh, we would just have to be there, make sure the videos are playing, make sure the, uh, if they are uh, uh, living, um, entities in a space, you make sure they are fed, and so on and so forth. So the presence of the curator is important. So when you collectivize this, uh, you, it works better than having uh, one, one person do that. The intergenerational conversations go for um, telling the story of art beyond just one uh, epoch or one um, generation. So. Uh, undergraduate students are shown with alumni, faculty, guest artists, um, international artists, and all of this is to preserve. It's not to hierarchize their participation, but to see how the works work together or interact on a, on, on a level playground. Accessibility programming is a consideration that because we are citing um, curating or art in a void, saying that it is always already uh, the many or beginning from the multiplicity. If the forms, processes, styles, trends, and so on um, are always in the multiplicity, we assume also that the audiences that visit the shows uh, would also belong in this category. So we go, um, we're not only having, let's say, Adults, we don't only think of adults to visit our show. We don't only think of people who can uh, see. We, we try to open up the scope of works to different modes of participation to be able to, um, uh, to be consistent with our argument on uh, equality and uh, the universal. The exhibition as experimental site is important because if art is, it doesn't have a fixed definition or fixed um, expression, that means that the exhibition can also uh, transform. Things can happen, things can change within that life that is staged. So we bring that um, experimental attitude into the curating as well. 
Um, the exhibition exists beyond one site, so we um, always like to think about it in terms of the physical, the virtual, um, the conceptual, and so on and so forth. All of these things are taken into consideration um, in the archipelago uh, direction. And uh, in 2017, we included the participation of the unknown artist who was the symbolic representation of the surplus population of exhibition cultures. We know that uh, if we read Hitoshteil, we'll be familiar with the uh, extreme exploitation that uh, tends to happen even in art, you know, with uh, assistant curators, researchers who go unnamed, uh, who go unpaid, and so on and so forth. So uh, when we talk of the precariats or the precariat class, uh, which by the Occupy movement we know uh, we are the 99%. We know that they are growing and it's not just in the economic field and art tends to, if we take it for granted, um, uh, exploitation is not far from it because it already internalizes uh, these capitalist systems of, um, or these processes really. So um, the key is not to take what we are doing for granted and to also use the exhibition, not as a closed system, but to see how um, we could also consider the counter arguments to the arguments that we have raised in the show itself. So that becomes, uh, all of these things are playing out in the shows that we curate or organize. And this gives you an idea. This is one flaw. The large scale shows happen at the Museum of Science and Technology in Accra, and it's on three levels. So they, uh, this is on the first floor, and this is a section of it. We'll see how animated uh, that section was just by putting. Uh, You had a cock crow, so here is the cock you had. For example, if you if you limit the expression of art to as mentioned, a hand and eye approach. Um, that means you would have to contrive every mode of expression to those methods and those um, the modes or styles and so on and so forth. What if you wanted to uh, deal with life itself, not, not an abstraction of it? You know, what if you were interested in let's say, uh, not using a brush to paint, but the paint itself as, a, uh, as your medium. You see, what if you wanted to respond to issues of ecology or uh, um, biology, but you didn't want to you know, contrive it? What if you wanted to use the thing itself? It didn't, there was no provision for that um, in the, in the previous uh, epoch. So this is where we want to, um, in the College of Art now, no artistic discipline is um, stigmatized. But really, we, the independent approach is what we encourage, and that is what I have benefited from, largely. So these are artists who are dealing with um, issues and if it's contemporary arts, they are political.
This is work by Livingston Amakun. He's based in Kumasi. Uh, yeah, and he is uh, concerned with issues that relate to the um, Anthropocene and is responding to it through his work. And for example, you see that in this, um, in this way, we are also considering uh, if we want to be consistent, we cannot put the human being at the, at the center of, of things. So um, if you are democratizing, um, we are shifting uh, perspectives. We are shifting the, the life forms that can exist or that are possible. So yes, the snail is also feeling its way through the space and checking uh, it out in its own way. Um, there are uh, biological life forms that exist, synthetic ones, uh, mechanical, you know, um, and all of these different, or these, um, this diversity becomes possible. This is uh, a horticulturalist based in Kumasi who is growing strawberries, and he grows them in a rice uh, rice medium. So he's also, you know, trying to come up with because the stereotype is that strawberries don't grow in in the tropics. You see, so uh, if you want to do it, how do you do it? And he's doing it there. So the attitude is what we we're interested in working with him uh, on. And um, it doesn't mean that he has to tra traditionally go through art school to be, um, to work with us. Well, when we are opening the scope or the, or, or the framework of what is possible uh, in art, it necessarily impacts curating. If you have living systems in the space like plants, um, snails, cocks, they need to be fed, they need to be, you know, cared for. And this is where uh, the, let's say the traditional notion of curating, you know, the care is, is, um, is taking seriously. So uh, yeah, the, this is Selom Kuji. He was a co-curator in the orderly disorderly exhibition and he was um, feeding the, uh, the snails, making sure they were always, uh, <laughs> that they didn't get lost, making sure uh, we could always account for them because that was a responsibility that we um, opened ourselves up to and we could not be reckless or careless in that sense. So um, it goes beyond dealing with maybe uh, flat objects or um, things that are inanimate. And when all these come into play, we have to account for them. Uh, I don't know if this has been there for quite a um, long time. Uh, no, it's the same time, but oh, only the machine that was used. Uh, on maybe, you know, when we're putting it up, we yeah. pressed it. Oh, okay. we pressed yeah, it. so that's why. Uh, this video shows a, uh, a group of physically disabled uh, people. I think um, blindness is one of uh, such categories. And um, we worked actively with institutions that um, care for uh, the blind and work with them. Uh, this is where the accessibility is important. So we translate uh, exhibition material into Braille. We translate them into local languages. We translate. We're trying to find uh, various modalities or uh, forms through which to disseminate or to make the works um, accessible. And here, when they visited the space, they were actually telling us that we shouldn't have exhibited the, uh, the, the curatorial statement in that way. Because if, if you were reading the Braille, the vertical um, method means that it's, it's inconvenient. So next time the horizontal way, and then it makes it so, so they can stand and they don't have to you know, um, contrive their positions in space. So uh, all of these things were uh, feedback 
that we received. And, you know, they, they add to what we do in the future. Uh, this is another one. Aeroplane engine or yeah, aeroplane. Yeah. aeroplane engine. Yeah. Because of the challenges, the structural challenges of the uh, building, the Museum of Science and Technology itself, it was the interior was designed in, in such a way there were there are no elevators. So if you were um, in a wheelchair, for example, uh, or or if you were just uh, may, maybe old and couldn't um, manage the stairs, it was inaccessible to you just by design. Uh, so we had to mitigate this in a way. So what we did was to um, document all of the works on uh, all three floors of the building and organize them into um, a new video experience. And, and we designated uh, one location in the exhibition area where uh, people who had such challenges would uh, not be excluded from, uh, if they couldn't physically be present in the space, they could at least access uh, and have a sense of what was happening on the other floors of the building as well. And um, uh, yeah, this was one of the ways that we, uh, we actively tried to um, transcend that, that problem in, in the building's design itself. Uh, in other, um, or at other times, uh, when the official timing had closed for the exhibitions, it could become, we could turn it into a, a, a space where we are screening videos, we're uh, screening films. Sometimes there are lectures that happen in the space because we think of the exhibition spaces as extensions of the, of the classes that we have um, in, 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 in school or in Kumasi, so um, it's not, we don't, um, we are indifferent really to the traditional academic structure. We open it up and if anyone is interested, uh, we, we welcome them. So the idea is that the exhibition could be a space where we are producing knowledge, we are um, learning, sharing, and all of those things. So uh, it's, functions keep changing. This is uh, an open air theater just external to um, the building. So we use that for uh, talk events and uh, readings and other um, discursive and performance related events. Uh, when you come to our exhibition spaces, the scaffold is one of the things that you will find uh, that, that is very present. It, it shows you there's work in progress. You know, we, uh, some, some of the works, as the exhibition goes on, it keeps growing. So like with this work, for example, um, Livingston's work, the, these are snail shells. So the snail shells were contrasted with actual snails and the shells uh, would pop up anywhere from the eaves of the building, onto the columns and, you know, we're literally growing in the space. And that was by design. This is uh, by Taquest, um off-site pro project for Orderly Disorderly in 2017, where we engaged uh, uh, the public space as well. Um, the, you know, interactive things like games and videos, uh, art, artists are uh, uh, advancing in these areas as well. So that also creates its own um, audience base. And because, I'll show you the video. This is Kelvin Hazel's uh, 
video object in the exhibition space. And um, the exhibition ran for two months, orderly disorderly. And because we were there uh, until about 7 or 8 p.m. every day, Monday to Sunday, there were uh, high, uh, junior high school students and primary schoolers who usually you pay to play video games. There are video game centers. So um, one person told another and, and so on and so forth. So after school, our exhibition spaces were very busy. You know, kids would come through, play the video games, and, uh, and because there were sounds and so on, some would dance, and uh, it, it was never a dull moment. Um, and because they felt welcome, they also uh, were very active. These are different ways that the objects or the works in the space allow for um, audiences, not just to, uh, to take a distance or contemplate, but uh, some are immersive, some are performative, um, and others require uh, act activation in order to, to, be, to find uh, meaning. So we see all these different things coming together by the starting point that we take, that in principle art ought to be accessible to um, everybody. Um, yes, so you make a lot of friends, you, you put yourself in uh, a very interesting position. These are, uh, this is work by Lois Adeakwa. Um, to the left was for, uh, these are two separate exhibitions. Uh, and she leaves after the performance, after the live uh, work, the object, the drawing, and the fabric is left um, in the space and it finds its own uh, life to live on. There are video installations that um, were present and all these various uh, ways the external environments are not left out. So we, we always try to think about um, things in close proximity or, or um, far away. This we have Ibrahim Muhammad's work. This was in 2015 for Silence Between the Lines. This is another angle of it. Uh, here we have, um, this is a building located at the car park of the, uh, of the Museum and Science of, of Science and Technology in Accra. And for the exhibition uh, for Orderly Disorderly in 2017, because we had the tr trilogy of exhibitions at, at the same uh, location. So the three years saw the space transformed in um, new ways. And this is the same location in 2016. And then um, Kwabina, or Kwame Jari's work uh, takes over the following year. This gives you a different angle to the, the work from orderly disorderly. The atrium of the building was also incorporated into the um, the sites of, of display. So Kelvin Hazel's work is uh, to the left. We have how it was, how you experience the work from the interior of the structure. And then to, 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 to the right is from the roof of the building. Um, Ajokisa's work for Silence Between the Lines in 2015, her handmade um, drawings. Uh, we also exhibit archives from the Kumasi school that really, because we are 
bringing in these histories and incorporating them into how they uh, impact our time. We exhibit journals from the 60s. In this case, um, Uche Okeke, who was, uh, is a prominent um, Nigerian modernist painter, became an external uh, examiner, him and a few others from the um, Zaria group, who, uh, so during that time, um, we bring out materials that speak to these histories and his poems and other uh, literary works were exhibited as part of this. So if an audience was interested in really digging into the archives and um, because we wanted to tell the history of art in Ghana from the modern period uh, or, or even the pre-modern um, into the contemporary epoch and how all of these can exist in the same space. Uh, this is Kofi Dawson's work for Orderly Disorderly. We showed works that he had made in 1967 and works that he made uh, after that. Kofi Dawson is one of the first three students who um, began the, the degree program in KNUSD in 1964. So, you know, uh, fresh graduates in 2017 uh, exhibiting with you know, these um, legends of, of Ghanaian art. And it's important that we put all of these into one conversation. This is Dorothy Amenuke's work. And then we move on to um, Benjamin Okante's work that uh, transforms plastics in, uh, through the various layering and uh, heating processes. So I think Tracy Thompson will continue from here. Shall you please help me give Tracy a round of applause as she comes up? say thank you to uh, the DAD, the DAD and the organizers, and as well as Kwesi uh, Ohineaye and the support of Black Star Lines community. Okay. Um, talking about the, talking about the theme of universality and multiplicity, it has become a very important aspect um, of my work, especially looking at how art um, was taught, though it's still there in the senior high school, prior to me coming to KNUST, of course, the limitations of mediums and expression um, in, in terms of the language of art and tools and processes were very much limited even in terms of painting and all of that. So this coming to such a community which um, is unprejudicial towards any medium, of course, gave room for many explorations and it, it also expands the scope, whether it's um, looking at synthetic or biological forms, whether it's looking at um, Things that are on Earth or on space, or it's it's a very wide universe we live in, and the fact that art can respond to things that are immanent within um, our contemporary experience, and this is what has shaped my work for a long time. And in 20, uh, the work you see at the left uh, from 2017 at Orderly Disorderly Exhibition is one of the works I explored using plastic material. So what you see here is produced from styrofoam. Styrofoam, the white uh, packaging that comes with um, industrial produced gadgets. They are sort of the, the packages that hold or protect these gadgets and exploring these materials through various processes and what um, uh, the 
what inspires this kind of practice is how uh, materials in themselves, how they can be mutated, how they can change, how they can go through certain life um, forms. And those kind of transitions of material became, um, yeah, became my interest. And looking at the work here, um, it annexes the Sputnik, yeah, one of the most controversial <laughs> technology of the 1950s and it being a satellite that annexes the Sputnik, and you have at the ground floor the, the work of my colleague, Esther, who creates this organic um, ecology. So you have moths and other life forms um, as well. And the fact that this work comes into this space, this kind of ecology and symbiosis between the material is something that is also inherent with um, the, the, the material of plasticity itself, which I'm a bit obsessed with. <laughs> Knowing how um, styrofoam being sourced from petrol and in this process um, bringing it back into petrol and mixing it with oil paint. And all these processes um, I take very key note of because they also simulate the happenings of how these products are made and how we get it. When you think of fossil fuels, how they decompose, you, it's a very highly dense material in terms of time, in terms of space, in terms of things and how all this is compressed into that black gold, I should say, yeah, which we know as oil and is put into uh, fractionation chambers and you have your natural gas, your coal and petrol, but this is sourced from uh, petroleum products and that for me was very important and creating this work also by um, the influence of environmental factors that, of course, are not seen, and gravity. So, yeah. So that's the work. And gravity also becoming very important within this work. So thinking about multiplicity and universality, all these little subtleties that form the work is something I pay key attention to. So knowing how the material is being used, it's originally coming as this rigid white um, blocks of foam and now creating this kind of um, biomorphic forms from it and also geological formations which become part of the, of the work and taking advantage of the viscoelasticity property of the material itself as you mix it with the oil and the oil paint and also the eruption of, um, okay, I don't know if the other shots, maybe we could go back to see the work, the one at the bottom right, uh, you would, the one at the bottom right, the close shot of it, you could see these air pockets and all of that. And that became very important to the life of this material because even as it goes through that process, that Ouroboros process of going back to its source, the petroleum, and it, and it being dissolved into it, what happens is the, the latent air in the material becomes erupted and much more visible as it goes through that process because it's foam, it's inflated polystyrene polymer. And all these things become very key within the work. Yeah. And from these shots you could you could hear the pulses of the satellite and all these things come together even as we think of uh, materials and how they permeate within um, each other. And that became one of the things that influenced the, 
the composition of all these works. They are not in isolation. They all interact um, to each other. Okay. So coming down to um, much more of my recent work. So in discovering the so minus in discovering the possibilities of materials. And this is one of the projects I'm still working on. Currently, this at the studio at Stadel uh, at Daimler Strasse. And this is me working on a bioplastic project. So what I do is, in looking at my interest in the possibilities of material, uh, what I do is I... What I do is I take processes that are already there, even used in the industrial world, and employ and also tweak certain things from it. So knowing the bioplastic processes, so what you see here is uh, plastics made from ultra-processed foods. I use very everyday, um, everyday things that we eat, which is biscuits, Tom Brown, Tom Brown is cereal, oats, a whole number of things which I ma manipulate them into numerous. So these are, this is the kind of multiplicity and freedom which I explore is very key uh, to my practice. And looking at these, um, and looking at these kind of forms, they are manipulated to whether fabric, fabric forms, your biscuit turn into fabric forms, or they become um, like glass and all of that. And all these transitional materials became my interest, which I'm exploring. And hopefully I'll be showing, uh, that is on February 15th at the Rundgang show this year, yep. And I'll give you a sneak peek of what you'll be seeing. Yeah, so these are my latest works. So the brown works you see is made of Leibniz biscuits, which come in the form of like these synthetic leaves. So I take these everyday materials and I use it to simulate, you know, very organic biomorphic forms. And the yellow ones you see is made of a local food we call fufu, a plantain. This plantain fufu is like this, um, not a pudding, but it's made out of a, of a flour that is very starchy. It's a very commonly known food. And I explore the work within these various um, forms. Okay. Yeah, so you still have a sneak peek of what I'm up to. So all these kind of processes, of course, um, the things that I learn from the materials, because going through um, art and trying to rediscover art in its different processes and languages, um, I begin to learn myself new things, and that will include using bacteria and other forms because the bioplastics generally are created because of, um, because of uh, the activity of microbes. And that become a very key thing to my practice as well. So you could um, see detailed shots of the wax I create. So this one is made of um, fufu. All right, um, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, Tracy, for sharing your practice with us and for uh, giving us an insight into the political convictions and conceptual ideas that inform your practice. Um, if you, 
if you, like many of us here in the room, have uh, experienced how to work in cultural institutions in a European context, uh, it is very challenging to, to realize that uh, so much would be possible <laughs> in our institutions. Um, and I was very struck by, by the point you make in f grounding your practice in this idea of equality and universality. It is a very different framework than the one that is chosen here to discuss how to engage audiences, which is a very patronizing way that always restates the position of the institution and the curators in charge. I would like to, to open the the floor, open the discussion and invite you, thank you for sh sharing your time with us tonight. Um, I feel the two of you, you sh should be sitting here if we are opening the discussion. And I will pass the mic to whoever wants to speak or, yeah, Aaron is going to pass the mic, just for the matter of having a record for, for our documentation. That's why you need to take the mic. Yeah, so, is anybody open to start, the, ready to start the conversation? Yes, please. Hi, Tracy, back here. Um, my question is, um, are these bioplastics also, um, um, are you incorporating them into everyday objects, in, in the sense producing everyday objects, or um, are you looking at it from, uh, as, you know, um, uh, as, as, as conceptual um, art pieces? Well, I wish to see the person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the question again, if I'm using... Sorry, the question again. Maybe I should have stood up in the first place. Um, so question is mm -hmm. that um, with these uh, plastics, yeah. bioplastics that you're creating or um, synthesizing in a way, um, are you also thinking about producing um, functional objects, like everyday objects, not functional, I wouldn't say functional, but everyday objects, uh, or are you looking at it um, um, as, a, as a conceptual work, um, following up on your sneak peek, I guess? <laughs> uh, okay. Um. I'll say it's both, but not so much of the first one, because um, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking at um, the work ended up necessarily being a functional object. Um, it's not really my aim yet, but um, there can be certain forms that may suggest slightly um, certain things we use, but it's much more um, though from a conceptual basis of plasticity, um, I explore the extent of materials and all of that, yeah, but that also comes in as well. But at the moment, I, I, I study these materials in terms of their behaviors and the possibilities. And of course, but, um, what I was saying, my interest into geological formations and all of that, that's what um, bets my work through that learning process of the material. That's, yeah. So I don't know for certain how everything would be at every exhibition. It's, it can change. Yeah, thank you. Ah, to the theoretical approach. 
um, and then uh, Tracy to see how, how you sort of uh, work with it when you, you start from the same principles and um, you have the same foundation. If I understood correctly, Tracy, then um, uh, at Kumasi the idea of having a dual system of practical fine arts and theoretical art discourse is not made in that sense. It's more taught as one. Am I, that's sort of the first question I have, maybe if I, if I understood that correctly. And if yes, I think it's really interesting to see how um, you uh, sort of further develop these conceptual approaches and you, Tracy, sort of work with the materials, with this really um, yeah, exploration of form, of shape, and uh, you are very text-based, you work with language and, and concepts, and uh, you both come sort of from the same, um, yeah, from the same principles. I'd be really interested to hear how you sort of developed from there and how you got there. So two questions, really. <laughs> Yes, I think you have summarized it nicely. Um, <laughs> in the sense that, yes, there are, uh, so for example, in the, in, in the College of Art now in Kumasi, what we have is uh, artists in the, from undergraduate to postgraduate. Because it's, traditionally trains artists uh, and we, well, our progenitors saw the death in um, art, crit art criticism, um, curating and so on and so forth. The imperative was to radicalize the teaching and that's where the emancipatory art teaching of Karikacha Seidu comes in. It is indifferent. It's indifferent to the binaries that uh, have been carved out, you know, artist, curator, um, writer, blah, blah, blah. So pretty much we're all taking the same programs or we're all studying theory, we're all um, taking the practical lessons, we're all in a studio program and we're all, but the expression of this, because it, it harnesses or it nurtures that independent attitude we're all taking the same programs, but the way we express them uh, vary. So, uh, and that ensures the, and it is true, literally, that if the both of us uh, use the same material or engage the same material, the way in which we process the information or even articulate them or uh, use them will inevitably vary based on my interest or my uh, my experiences and so on and so forth. So the foundation we share um, and some, depending on your leaning, you could pursue it in um, a variety of ways if you decide to or just in one mode if that's your, your inclination. So for me, I went through a program that, um, but you will see that I'm not necessarily the training we get, the curating, we say that we are trained to curate from boat and nut to high theory and back. You see, so it's not just a theoretical approach. You, are, um, you really must be able to make an exhibition from the ground up. First, because we don't have the luxury of um, maybe uh, being assigned professionals to work with you or for you, to, um, to buy equipment for you. You really have to be, um, you have to play these multiple roles. And that, I think, is where the emancipation is. If the training pro, uh, inhibits me from doing that, that is where the problem is, you, uh, you see. But if you are trained to uh, f uh, open yourself up to as many experiences, that is where I think the true, um, you know, Emancipation lies. Um, question to Chrissy um, about uh, Seidu and how difficult it actually was to 
change that existing system. And um, I was wondering if he, I suppose he made a lot of opposition at the time and around what time that happened. I don't recall exactly from what you told. And where did he find support and maybe also inspiration? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, Karikacha Seydou is, he really, well, we say that he inspired um, Black Star Lines and what it's doing now. He was in 19, he was a member of the first batch of uh, MFA students at KNUST in, I think, 1993. And that batch really, uh, um, if we are to take it back, they are the, perhaps the instigators of uh, what we have later inherited uh, decades later. They, um, understanding what art meant for, uh, for them and understanding the lens through which art education and its practice had been um, acquired you know, in the academy. Those first batch of MFA students are really the ones who were pushing the boundaries, who were um, exploring text as form, uh, moving out of the, the Boza canon, really. And it was their work that was also nipped in the bud after they graduated. Uh, so because of the official, uh, what had been officially sanctioned at the college, which we talked about, in the range of, um, mediums for painting and sculpture. Uh, they first challenged it, but Seydou is the one who sort of came back and revived uh, that um, subversive or that revolutionary attitude. So he, um, he first enrolled in the M MFA program in 93, and then he joined the Faculty of Art in 2003. So uh, for him, he puts it like this. He, uh, for his practice, he wanted to stop making art symbolically and embark on a practice of making artists. This is how he puts it. So that became his practice. Pedagogy became a site of practice for him, you see. And it, uh, that is where he realized his political ambitions. And of course, uh, that was not taken um, uh, as, uh, yeah, the whole system was based on an anterior, uh, you know, framework. So how do you break through that? And I, he, he really endured. And because he joined the faculty, now he was able to exercise uh, influence, and it's still there, the resistance. What I'm talking about is not mainstream in Ghana in any way. You see, this is still uh, a community that uh, just uh, articulating an alternative um, uh, worldview of artistic practice, and it's not the mainstream by any stretch of the, of the imagination. So that is, um, after his initial experiments, then he began to form collectives. That is where the collectivist um, orientation of the group also comes to play, because you can't do it alone. And Seydou couldn't have done it alone. You know? um, so he started to seek um, kinship with younger faculty, um, younger artists. He started to reach out to, um, international uh, co communities. Actually, uh, I think it's good that we have uh, um, Willem here, because he is one of the uh, active collaborators who established that um, inter, inter, uh, the exchange program between the state of Shula and KNUST. So these have all been ways that we've been actively, just not trying to isolate um, ourselves and what we do, but remaining consistent and true to the uh, to our own axioms. You see, so we have to reach out, we have to talk, but we always make sure that we are, um, you know, we create a system that is mutual 
you see. And it's hard to do like was expressed because we have a whole global system that takes inequality for granted, you know, yeah, in terms of how we value people, in terms of how uh, we interact. So how do you, e equality becomes a subversive idea just by that uh, um, hegemonic construct, you see, and it's there in economics, it's there in culture. Every day we really deal with the oracle of inequality, you see, so how do we, so it's not just in word, we practice it. I can't argue you into or out of equality. I must act on it. And that is where the, uh, the will and everything like that comes into play. And so you act. Yeah, thank you. My own. I have... Um uh, the question comes up because of the, the um, word interacting and equality, and it's a bit of a technical question, but maybe um, it's also a bit of a phantasmo, uh, phantasmagorisch, phantasma, doesn't matter. Uh, because on your slides in the beginning, um, in this intergenerational collaborations, you also mentioned the non-living. And um, later also the unknown artist comes in. I wonder maybe to give more images of your practice, um, how do you exactly, for example, collaborate with the dead or, because I think that's something that so many people really would love to do more successfully in these days. And what are your strategies to involve the non-living? Uh, how does it take place and take shape in the place? Is it in the hearts more than on view? Or that would be my... Um, Curiosity to know. Yes. It, yes, that is um, the conscious effort to um, to be dispositionally indifferent is is what leads us in that direction. Um, for example, in 2017, for orderly disorderly, that exhibition took its title from. Abbas Kiarostami's work. And Abbas Kiarostami is the Iranian um, filmmaker, poet, and so on, who um, was, we would say, uh, he, also, he affected the film form. You know, the, the attitude he brought to filmmaking was uh, also very subversive in Iran, um, where he was based in his, just his willful um, decision to remain in Iran uh, after the revolution and deciding to, whilst his co colleagues were leaving, and he thought that crisis was an opportunity to also, uh, you know, remain and kind of have an influence within that, um, that sphere. That attitude was, for us, um, something we wanted to reflect on. And um, so we won't limit uh, the scope of what we are doing to just Ghanaians, uh, you know, because if, 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 if we're talking about the attitude, you know, Kiaris um was one such practitioner who, artist transcending genres, and he, he brought a certain verve uh, to the practice, which we thought was um, important to honor. So we were honoring his life work, and, um, even though we, uh, and the title that we, we, we used also borrowed from a work of his. And that work in particular, um, I forget the year he made it, but um, I think his work was orderly or disorderly. So we took out the or. Uh, you know, and in that, he, in his films, he stars children, he stars women, he, um, in the cultural context that he, where he was working, these were thought to be, um, you know, they, would, they were not mainstream. So once we um, identify these, and even uh, staging the work of Godilai, the Cameroonian conceptual artist whose work, uh, for Lai's work, because he had participated in a workshop, I think in 2011, so we, um, he died, I think um, the workshop was a year prior. I think he died in 2011. I'm not sure. So 
because of that encounter, because of the relevance that he had, not just to um, Black Star Alliance projects, but just the influence he has in Cameroon particularly, and him establishing the uh, Art Bakery as a project space for contemporary art practice uh, that benefits artists in the region, you know, um, we reflect on these things. And so we take, we make these efforts to uh, understand the global network that we exist in, you see, and how um, through conviction you can still engage it not on its terms, but uh, once you, yeah. yeah maybe I, this uh, helps my question, but the point was, um, sorry, no, what, maybe I um, um, put the wrong uh, emphasis. I, I think my, my main curiosity was not the international collaboration, but the um, collaboration with the non-living, because you mentioned the non-living, and how do you give, uh, that was, but you, of course, you are not. Um, I, I will not force uh, you to answer it again. <laughs> but I, that was the, because yeah. I've, if, I'm sure you have seen the Isa Samp, um, so to say, uh, what, these kind of practices. I wondered if you also have this kind of. Which kind um, of practices? Isa the practice songs? of, um, for example, laboratoire agit art to remember uh, a friend uh. and to, so to say, declare him undead through mm -hmm. the continuation of a practice, for example. Oh. It's, not, it's just, I wondered when you said you're working with the non-living, mm -hmm. I was curious mm -hmm. if there's a certain way to do that or what that oh. means for you. But I don't, also don't want to take too much time. Yes, uh, if any let me think about that. But um, in in... In practice, that's what we, what we engage. This we are really indifferent to whether or not the artist is living. Once they are relevant to the work we are doing, we um, we try to um, engage their work in um, in a practical way. Does anybody else want? And oh. sorry. <laughs> Maybe uh, when I say indifference, I think that there, there was a time I got a, um, a question. Uh, do, you, do I mean to be neutral? You, you know, does that mean neutrality? And in this context, um, it doesn't. This kind of um, indifference is condition. It's a political one that is an action rather than withholding uh, you know, from uh, belief or action or something like that. So when you put yourself in a dynamic that, um, you, you know, that which we are calling the multiplicity, where the, the all is at once invoked, uh, yes, you can't be neutral, especially when it comes with uh, baggages of history, you know, and if it's a colonial history, you know that you can't be uh, neutral, you know, because in politics, what we say, you're either here or there. That's where strict binary uh, logic works. So um, it's a political kind of indifference that is based on action and that is based on uh, conviction. So it is not the, to withhold or to be neutral to something. Hi, um, thank you guys for your presentation. It was really enlightening. Um, this question is for you um, in regards to the first presentation. So you still hold the mic. <laughs> um, I was wondering, because you talked a lot about the history in terms of the colonial influences, and I was wondering whether there was any room for indigenous art practices in the education and if they were part of the curriculum uh, then and maybe even now? Um, they were not part of the curriculum then. In, the, in 1882, when the educational code was invoked, it was not implemented until 1909. And uh, in 1909, when the hand and eye training took, uh, was, was taught in training colleges in Accra, uh, 
they were actually, uh, they were dismissive or they were just, they kept indigenous uh, knowledge systems, modes of, um, or aesthetic systems out of it. We have to understand that because they were cut, it was essentially a cut and paste thing, you know, so they were, it came from um, Britain, they trained their, their, their teachers and they exported them to the colonies and they would teach what they knew. But there, there was a moment between the world wars when um, the, the first art teacher, G.A. Stevens, who was trained at the Slade College of Art, he, uh, well, Slade S School of Art, he began to question this system. The, so the British uh, teacher came and he was, his project was to undermine the hand and eye uh, system that was uh, that prescribed indigenous uh, aesthetic forms and um, systems outside of the curriculum. So for him, he took uh, that step into critiquing it and beginning to uh, invite local carvers and uh, uh, you know other crafts uh, makers and inviting them to teach courses in the art school. But because he too could not move away from the uh, deterministic you know, logic inherent in the colonial enterprise, he also believed that um, you know, Africans were pre-logical, pre-modern. And because time was thought of in that linear <laughs> progression, you would start from somewhere and evolve to, to another um, place. And the European destiny was the destiny of all of humanity. So he had internalized this, and he couldn't really uh, revolutionize the curriculum that he had set out to do. But of course, he raised very important questions about it, and that sort of opened up the curriculum a little bit, you know, to uh, local production and um, indigenous histories. When art history began to be taught in the College of Art, in the degree um, period in 19, from 1964. We'll bear in mind that Ghana uh, achieved its independence in 1957. So that is a, that was a post-colonial uh, epoch, right? And in 1960 was when the educational reforms had been uh, proposed by Sir William Coldstream. He was a very influential um, artist, pedagogue who influenced art education in Britain. So in 1960, they also had a craft-based NDD program, which, they, uh, which was um, revised in the 60s. And that all, uh, in 1964, that was implemented in Ghana. So you see how contemporaneous uh, you know, those uh, changes were. So art history became a thing to, to be taught in schools. But when it was taught in, the go in Ghana, it was European art history. Um, but as the years went by uh, after the Zaria, uh, later in the 20th century, when the Zaria rebels had um, you know, also questioned the, 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 uh, these European formats and incorporating local um, subject matter into the works, those were moments of uh, reform or or revolutions, but those were also halted somewhere in the 80s and 90s um, in Ghana, for example, you know, for many reasons. Um, there, were, there was political unrest between 1966 and the late 80s in Ghana, you know, so, uh, and then globalization kicked in, structural adjustment became a thing, you know, so all of those things sort of froze uh, the curriculum into, um, a capsule and it couldn't really, so in order to become an artist, you had to be uh, radically motivated. And that's where the first batch of MFA students in 1993 really began to instigate 
uh, this kind of change. And then in, since 2003, has been a, what we call a silent revolution. So we're reforming the curriculum. And then we're taking the local systems of production, local um, uh, forms of aesthetics, we are taking them, incorporating them into how we think and understanding uh, the global network also that we exist in. So now, it, where, whichever direction you want to go, uh, you are not inhibited. Yeah. If there are no further questions, I would like to invite you to have a drink and to thank you for instigating or instillating us with the idea of a silent revolution that may yeah, expand if we continue talking and exchanging. And I hope very much to stay in touch with the two of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, thank you to everybody. The, I've made some very new friends since my five months in, uh, uh, in Berlin. And I want to thank you all for taking time to come, uh, those who joined us uh, via Facebook. Thank you for coming and... <laughs> okay, I want to say thanks to William Derud for coming. <laughs> He's my professor at Stado. <laughs> thank you so much and I thank you, you for coming as well and the Black Star Alliance community joining us um, on live stream on Facebook. Thanks.